Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another AccuColor webinar series. Uh, today we have Tony Gill and a special guest, his daughter, uh, experimenting with photography. We're going to take questions during the webinar. Uh, we'll definitely have time for Q and A at the end. So if you have any questions, feel free to send them over. And uh, Tony, thanks for joining, and we're always happy to have you present. Uh, take it away. Always a pleasure to be here. Thanks. Uh, hi, everybody. As you can see, my one-year-old is auditing uh, today's seminars. She'll probably leave about halfway through when my wife gets home. Her flight was canceled because of the virus. So uh, I am Tony Gale. I am a BenQ ambassador. And today we're going to be talking about experimenting with photography. In addition to being a BenQ ambassador, I'm also a Sony artist of imagery, a Manfrotto ambassador, and an x right Colorado, just in case any of those brands come up. And like we said, we're going to cover experimenting with photography. Uh, for those of you who don't know who I am, uh, which is probably a lot of you, uh, I'm a commercial photographer based here in New York City. I shoot for a variety of corporate advertising and editorial clients. So one of the things I talk about at the beginning of almost every talk I do is that now is an exciting time to be a photographer. There's an amazing amount of things we're able to do with the technology that's available to us. Things that were impossible 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, it just couldn't be done. And that's not even including all the fancy AI supplements, um, which you, know, you can love or hate. They are what they are. Uh, but we can do incredible things because of the equipment that's available to us. Um, also, just as a quick aside, uh, BenQ just announced two new monitors, the SW272U 27-inch 4K monitor, 99% of Adobe RGB, 100% of sRGB. Uh, it's available for pre-order now. If you have any questions about this or this other monitor, the SW272Q, same 99% RGB, 100% sRGB, but 2K. Uh, if you have any questions about that, you can put them into the chat or the Q&A and uh, Ollie will answer them for you as we go along. And as he mentioned, if you have any questions as we go, please put them in and we'll try and get to them. So to begin with, photography has uh, so many ways to do things. And for the most part, people tend to think of there being right ways and wrong ways. I think as we get more experienced, um, we're, and we get more used to the most efficient ways to do things, the best ways to do things, best in quotes. Um, we sometimes forget to play and to experiment. And I think that's important, even though a lot of experiments don't work very well. I've certainly tried a lot of things. Unfortunately, I don't always process them out. So there's only some examples here of things that, you know, seemed like a good idea. And then, you know, it was fun to do. It didn't really work. With film, when I was starting out, I did a lot of things. You know, this cross-processing, that was a big thing. You know, you try different film, EPP, Kodak EPP worked really well, cross-processed. Cross-processing was where you process negative film as slide film or slide film as negative film. But then I'd try things like Ilford made XP2, which was a black and white slide film uh, and, or a black and white negative film that I would cross-process as slide film the first time I did it, the lab I took it to, nobody had ever done it. Just, but because I was new and wanted to try new things, it was fun. Kodak had a film called uh, Ectographic HC Slide Film. It was an ISO of eight, super high contrast. It was designed for text, but I played with it. Solarization, where you would take a print, flash it with light before you put the fixer on and you'd get this weird effect long exposures, Holgas, all these things that were fun to do. And, we, and I tried in part because I was new. So one thing, if nothing else, even if you hate every single suggestion I have today or disagree with everyone, which is fine. Um, anybody who says that their way is always the right way should probably be ignored. Um, but even if you hate everything I say, if you think about just trying something new and experimenting and thinking, well, you know what? I'm supposed to do it this way. 
So let me do that and then see what happens if I do it the wrong way. Sometimes it's cool, sometimes it's not. Often the right way, again, the right way in quotes, is it that way for a reason? And if you need that specific thing, that makes sense. So one of the reasons that I started thinking about and experimenting in the last couple of years, again, after years of not experimenting enough, is COVID. So early on in COVID, I was asked to do a little video. Afterwards, I did this little self-portrait. It's fine, you know, fine. But then I decided to do a self-portrait a day until I was legally allowed to photograph other people. In New York City, at that time, commercial photography was a category that wasn't allowed to be done until they opened things up more. So I couldn't just do self-portraits like this. That seemed boring. So I started experimenting a little. And every day I would try and do something different. So holding the light, double exposure with flash, setting the camera in the fridge, flagging the light, putting things in front of the lens, putting colorful things in front of the lens, uh, blasting a window with light and then putting myself in the shadow so that the shadow was it using color, holding my hand up, all sorts of different things. I did it for 80 days. Some of them were more successful than others. But it just reminded me of the importance of trying new things and experimenting. So I'm going to go over some of the ways that uh, I like to experiment. Like I said, some of these are more successful than others, but it's more the idea of it and just getting out there and trying new things. So the first and one of the easiest ways to experiment is with exposure. So we're all used to what is a correct exposure, right? You put the meter in the middle, you do what the camera says, you uh, use an incident meter to get it right, you meter off of a gray card, whatever it is, there's what is considered a correct exposure. Um, but sometimes a correct exposure and the exposure that gives you the best photo are not the same. So this was a photograph I took of the actor Terrence Stamp at an event where I'd asked to get permission to take photos. And they gave them to me, but didn't really want to. Um, so I didn't have a lot of control and the light was terrible. So I experimented with changing the exposure. This is very overexposed. The highlight side's basically gone, but it was by far the most interesting picture to me that I took that day because the fact that the light was terrible and the background was terrible and I had no control sort of faded away by overexposing it so dramatically. And with black and white in particular, uh, you can do cool stuff with that. With color, it, you can sometimes get some weird color shifts. It can get tricky, but that's not to say you shouldn't try. You know, so here, this is what would be the average normal exposure. The highlights are a little bright, but nothing's too bright, nothing's too dark. If I go really bright, it becomes a little ethereal, a whole different mood. If I go really dark, so you barely see the pier, but the clouds are, and the sky are more correctly exposed and not overexposed any longer. Again, it becomes very moody. So we go from fine, sort of magical and ethereal, dark and ominous, just by changing the exposure. Similar thing, trees here, this is just the exposure in camera, sort of trying to balance the highlights and the shadows. Not very interesting. Overexposing. Now we see the greens of the trees. Everything goes really bright. It has a different mood. Or underexposing where it starts to feel like the sun that was back there is actually the moon and it's nighttime. They do that a lot with motion pictures where they film day for night. Throw some blue on there. She's popping in to say hello, everybody. Um, throw some blue on there, make it feel like it's nighttime. There's a lot you can do with exposure just by experimenting. Really overexposed in an old barn. Or just here we are, boring light, much more moody. Now it sort of feels more, partly it's my expression, but also more moody and a little bit scary, even though it's brighter. You could do that, especially if you shoot raw, you can do that. Uh, in your raw process and you don't necessarily have to do it in camera. So here's a portrait I did uh, a few months ago. Way overexposing in the processing on the first one over from the right. 
or I'm sorry, from the left, you can see that the color starts getting weird when you overexpose it that much in processing with the that yellow. So I desaturated a little, made it a little more sepia looking, which was interesting. And then the old standby, if you're going to overexpose that much, black and white almost always looks cool. The eyes pop. The fact that it's a little abstract with black and white and with exposure tends to work better for me. I, I actually quite like the one on the right. Now, is it something I would normally do? No. Normally, I would try and expose correctly and get everything looking good and, and just go from there. But it's important to try new things. There's white balance and color. This is also where the importance of a good monitor, like my BenQs, I typically use the SW321C, um, really matter. You should calibrate your monitors. The BenQs are going to come with a calibration chart. They're going to be in good shape um, to start with, but keep on top of it. Because once you start messing with color, especially the color that's wrong, it's important to know that what you're seeing is an accurate representation of the file. So here's just a normal foggy day. Letting it go some blue, even more blue. This is starting to feel like the day for night that I talked about. It feels like nighttime, even more blue. Back to neutral. Adding in even more blue, moving that... Uh, that white balance slider all the way over. This, I think, went too far. This is the one I like the best of those. Um, but I also believe if you don't go too far, then you don't know that you went far enough. Try going until it's too much and then just back it off a little. Um, <clears throat> you can also, again, do that. Maybe you don't shoot RAW. Maybe you shoot JPEG. You can do that in software as well. So Photoshop. Uh, another one of the portraits from that one session. Just go in, messing around, just using the color sliders, adding some blue, adding some green. It becomes a very different feeling. Now, it's obviously not correct color. Um, it's not the most flattering skin tone, but it does create a mood. And you see things like this a lot in film where they'll put a heavy color grade on it. And as a viewer, it, it helps create the atmosphere and the mood that they're trying to create. But it doesn't, we don't necessarily always think about it or say, oh, wait, that color's weird. It just contributes to the feeling of what we're seeing. And we can do that with stills. It's a little different. It doesn't always work as well um, because we tend to stop and look at, at photos, still photos more. But... It's something to try and it can work really well. Uh, there's a really excellent advertising photographer, Nadav Kander, or Kander uh, who does a lot of cool things with color. I, rec I can encourage you to look him up. Um, cropping. So I like to crop in camera and do things like this. Um, you can also crop in post. There's nothing, there's absolutely nothing wrong with cropping after the fact. And for a lot of my work, I will actually shoot wider and crop later because I'd rather have more information and crop down than wish I'd added, I had something that's not there. But, you know, this isn't normal. This isn't normal. But it does become interesting to me when you add that tension with the person's face partially cropped out, it becomes a little bit more interesting. And so I encourage you to try that. Focus, another obvious, uh, simple way to experiment. Christmas lights, Christmas tree. This picture, not as interesting. Yeah, it's Christmas lights, it's Christmas tree. You can see the needles, you can see the lights, you can see the little bit of an ornament. But when it's really out of focus, I think it becomes more interesting. It becomes more abstract. You get a sense of it. You know it's Christmas lights. Um, but you don't need to know to see every little bit of detail. Sometimes you can go too far, so out of focus flowers, really out of focus flowers. On the other hand, this almost feels impressionistic. You know, there was early on in photography, moderately early on, early 20th century, um, a lot of people in photography were trying to do things that were a little bit more painterly, which is why the F64 group, which if you're familiar with them, it was Ansel Adams and uh, 
Paul Strand and people like that, where they were very much straight photography, everything sharp, F64, because they like to shoot at F64, so they had great depth of field. They wanted everything to be very straightforward, and that's great too, um, but sometimes not straightforward is the answer. This one, it's a silhouette of me in a barn upstate that I liked, uh, but I entered it in a photo contest and it got a third place. So you just don't know. You don't know what's going to resonate with people and you don't know what's, what you're going to like until you try things. Hi, little me. Negative space. We tend to try and fill the frame, I think, often, or put our subject right in the middle. Uh, but sometimes just adding space in this particular picture, this was the mayor of New Haven, Connecticut, a few years ago, you get a sense of the city hall space. But here, New York City with a ton of sky, it becomes a little more interesting, I think. It feels almost abstract with so little city and so much sky. All the shadow, a little bit of huff with just the subject in a tiny corner left even more uh, negative space. Tilting the horizon. Tilting the horizon is something that uh, if you're gonna do, I would encourage you to do it dramatically. If you tilt the horizon just a little, it just feels like you were sloppy. Um, if I'm photographing in the horizon just a little bit off, I'll just correct it in post. But if you do something dramatic like this, it feels intentional. And sometimes it gets interesting. This was the tube in London the first time I went there way back in 2000. Uh, yeah. You want to play with your buttons? Okay. Um, this is more interesting because of the tension caused by the angle, by the fact that the camera is tilted and it, it almost feels... To me, I never thought of it until just now, speaking of it, but there's a scene in 2001 in Space Odyssey where everything spins. It feels a little bit like that to me. Um, and I think that, that that adds some interest. Let's see if you wanna go down on the floor. Her mom will be home soon uh, and then uh, she'll pick her. Uh, placing things in front of the lens. So in general, we try not to have things obstructing our view, right? We don't want things blocking anything. We don't want things distracting. Uh, but sometimes having a little something there adds some interest. So this picture, uh, same barn upstate, I just have a couple of fingers in front of the lens. You can see the shadows left and right. So I'm causing vignetting with my hand and it helps focus our attention on on the subject and not be distracted so much by the rest of the barn. And we have a little outhouse upstate, and then here just adding with uh, intentionally taking the lens shade, holding it in front of the camera. So you can see if you look in the upper right, uh, you can actually see light again on the other side of the lens shade. So you're getting extreme vignetting because of the lens shade being used improperly, taking it off, physically holding it in front of the lens uh, can just cause an interesting effect. However, if you're gonna do that, so you see here, it's soft, it's out of focus. Here, it's sharper. I would encourage you to use a very shallow depth of field. Um, with a shallow depth of field, that edge is, in, is soft. With a greater depth of field, you know, maybe F11, F16, F8 even, it becomes hard and then it just feels like there's a thing in front of your lens. And then here we have same thing as the first one, just using my hand in front of the lens, shooting wide open. This was at one, two. And you get that out of focus blurriness from my hand just causing issues. And I actually quite like this picture. Um, having that little bit of out of focus uh, blur with the fingers makes it much more interesting. Uh, you can always use crop sensor lenses on full frame cameras. 
So APS-C lenses, micro four thirds lenses. Um, one thing that we're often told is you can't use APS-C lenses on full frame cameras. And that's true kind of. You can't do it if you want the whole image circle, um, the whole sensor to be exposed, but maybe you don't. Maybe you want it to feel like a little fisheye without the distortion. Uh, your APS-C lens, it's gonna depend on the lens. Uh, can have some interesting vignetting and cause it to feel just like something different. However, if you're going to do that, depending on your camera on Sony's, for example, Sony full frame cameras will automatically crop if you put an APS-C lens on there so that you don't get this vignetting. If you want that vignetting, if you want that effect, you have to go into the menu and turn it off. Um, I assume other camera menu Manufacturers are similar, but I can't say for sure. But if you put an APS-C lens on your camera, if you have one, I don't know that I would go and buy one necessarily unless you could get a cheap one. Um, and it, you don't see vignetting, <clears throat> then you probably have a menu setting that is automatically cropping it to avoid the vignetting because this would be not normal. This isn't what you want. Different APS-C lens. Vignetting is very different. This is the 16 to 50 with that almost square uh, aspect ratio. It actually feels a little bit to me like an old CRT TV. There's also something called free lensing. So I didn't come up with that term. I think it's a little weird. Free lensing is where you take your camera, you take your lens, you hold your lens in front of the camera, but it is not mounted to the camera. So it's a little, it's a very tricky thing to do to try and get focus, uh, but you get this interesting almost tilt shift effect where part of it's in focus, part of it's not. Uh, you can get this interesting flare, obviously the vignetting because the lens is not designed to be held in front of the camera. Um, you do need to hold it quite close, but you know just try and see if it's too far away, everything's just going to be a blown out mess. Um, you're also going to probably get dust on your sensor when you do this. So, you know, keep a blower handy. Same thing again, much more of a tilt shift effect. Even that tilt shift effect, I actually quite like these two. Um, another thing to try using flash with constant light. So, typically, we use flash to stop motion or uh, to overpower the lights that are there, right? Normally I'm using flash in a room. I don't worry about the room lights because the flash is gonna overpower them. My shutter speed is high enough that uh, the exposure for the ambient is irrelevant. It's too dark. Sometimes it's fun to combine the two. So this is flash on camera while I'm physically zooming the lens and I've, Chosen an exposure where the flash and the ambient both come into play. Like I said, if the flash is overpowering everything, then the exposure for the ambient isn't going to do anything. If you're at, you know, 1 16th of a second, F11 inside, it's probably way too dark for the ambient to come into play. So you're going to have to find an exposure where the ambient is exposed, not necessarily correctly, but enough to matter. Um, typically, I'll try for maybe a stop under with the flash being the main thing. But so this is on camera flat or no, the camera, sorry, the flash is not on camera. It's off to the right. And just physically zooming the lens while I shoot. Same thing again and again. Another way of doing this, if you want more control, because experimentation doesn't mean lack of control. Sometimes it does but it can also just mean uh, trying something new. If you have a strobe and a constant source light, LED, hot light, daylight, whatever it is, if you have the strobe on one side and the constant light on the other, so it's on the shadow side, um, more or less the strobe will expose one side, the constant light will expose the other, and they won't interfere with one another. So this was a test I did on myself where I have, 
an LED on my right, on our right, my left, and a strobe on the other side. And as I move, you can see that the flash is freezing the side that is only getting the flash exposure. And then the LED, because it's a long exposure, I think these were about half of a second or a second, the LED is exposing the shadow side. So it could be a more controlled, interesting effect. So trying that same effect with, uh, on a, with a portrait subject, this was all using the zoom, the same effect I used on the gentleman with the stone wall. Just zooming in and out, you can see on some of the more extreme ones, like the lower right, the, the flash exposed when I was zoomed out. And then as I zoomed in, the rest of his face got larger because that longer exposure is impacting the whole thing. And then the reverse, the one to its left, the center bottom, the flash side is bigger, the other side's a little smaller. Just try some things and see what works. Uh, it can be a fun effect. Uh, if I was doing these for something other than this demonstration, I would crop in on all of them so that uh, we don't see all of the extraneous lights around. This same subject, but doing the shadow side constant light. This was LEDs again uh, and strobes on the other side. If you choose to do this with something like tungsten lights or incandescent lights, keep in mind the color is going to be different, which is not right or wrong. It's just a thing. So you may have a very, very warm side that's moving, the shadow side, whereas the flash is cool or neutral on the warmth and very, very cool on the flash side. Okay, Aurora is about to leave us, everybody. Thank you for participating, young lady. Um, so this effect, I think it's very, very cool. Uh, you know, I'm obviously not the only person to do it. I'm not the only person to do any of these things. I did not invent any of them. Same effect again. Uh, one thing, if you're gonna do this, you want a very dark background. So you saw with the background, uh, with the gentleman with the stone wall behind him. As things move there, it can sometimes get lost in the background because the background has texture. If you're using white, it really doesn't work very well at all. If you use black, it works really well. We also have pixel shift. So depending on what camera you have, you may or may not have a feature called pixel shift. Uh, some Sony's have it, I know some other cameras have it as well. You should also be able to do a similar effect in Photoshop of what I'm showing you. But what pixel shift does is it moves the sensor uh, in subsequent frames. So my cameras, I have a four shot and a 16 shot pixel shift where it moves the sensor uh, physically half a pixel at a time, takes multiple shots, and then you combine them in certain software in post. The the reason for pixel shift is to get very sharp images that are very large and have very, very accurate color. What you're not supposed to do is move the camera. So of course I moved the camera. I think pixel shift where you move the camera can be very, very fun. It has a very interesting effect. Uh, this almost feels like it's a fabric. Sometimes it goes a little too far. Portraits can be kind of this weird painterly effect. Um, it's very much something where you have to experiment and try different things and see what works because, because it's done in post, even though the camera is part of its process, uh, you don't know what you're gonna get. So you have to try a lot of different things. This is one of the ones I liked the best. This was when I was doing COVID self-portraits. Uh, intentional camera movement, um, I see um, so ICM is one of those terms you might see on like Facebook groups and wonder what it is. Like I saw uh, BIF a million times before I realized it was birds in flight or bird in flight. You know, photography, like anything, there's all these acronyms and abbreviations. And if you don't know what they are, uh, Google it or ask somebody. And if somebody's snotty about it when you ask, then that person's not very nice and you should ignore them. Um, so ICM is intentional camera movement. And sometimes moving the camera can create some interesting effects. You have to experiment with shutter speed. You have to experiment with a lot of things. But here, for example, moving the camera, 
but at just the right speed so that the gentleman on the left on the phone is relatively sharp in his face and everything else is blurry. I think that's a fun effect. Moving the camera, moving the camera vertically. So here it is, just sort of wiggling the camera. It just feels sort of out of focus, right? Here, I'm moving the camera in the direction of the trees vertically. So they're sort of accentuated. People do this a lot with panning, with moving vehicles. This becomes more interesting, I think. Uh, panning, as I just mentioned here with the bicycle, going along so the bicycle is relatively sharp. Everything else is blurry. It helps accentuate motion. Uh, you can do the exact same thing with zooming. So I, we did zooming with the flash. Uh, on those portraits. This is zooming, uh, just pointing it at a tree. It almost feels like a kaleidoscope to me. It can be a fun effect. Uh, and then there's things like mounting your camera to a moving object. So here I have a camera mounted to a car, just doing long exposures as I drive around. It can be a very fun effect. Um, another thing in this, if you're going to try, um, be really careful because you might break your camera if you're not careful. Uh, I sometimes will throw my camera up in the air. So I'll try and do it. I have cameras that are very, very robust. I won't do it with my very expensive top-end cameras, but I have little cameras that are designed to be more able to take a beating like the RX-0. Throw the camera in the air. Don't do this with your main camera. Don't do this. Uh, if there's any chance you're going to break your camera, don't break your camera. Experimenting and breaking your camera, boy, you better get a good picture if you do. But this is just throwing the camera in the air. Here it is just as I'm about to catch it. You get some interesting effects. The camera's spinning around. You have very little control. Um, I like the serendipity of just seeing what happens. And this... This was not throwing the camera in the air, but this, the one that we used as the uh, example picture for this talk, this is a copper uh, pot maker in Monte, Montefiore, I think. Uh, in Tuscany, he makes copper pots and pans. A uh, very nice gentleman. Here he is doing some work on this little ornament he made for us. Um, this is the most interesting picture I took of him. I took a bunch of pictures. Uh, the space was very cool, but I couldn't really direct him to do anything. And I didn't love any of the pictures I took, except this one that really felt like there was some vibrancy to it. So think about moving the camera. Normally we want a sharp picture. We don't want the camera to move. We've got the whole reciprocal rule, you know, one over the focal length of your lens to keep it sharp. Plus you've got image stabilization. Sometimes turn that stabilization off and just, Go crazy. Another thing to try, and this is very old school, is pinholes. So pinhole cameras, for those of you who don't know, are you take your camera, or in the past, the first pinhole I did was I got an old Whoppers box, taped a piece of four by five film in it, cut a hole in the other end, put some aluminum foil over it, poked a hole in it. A pinhole is just using a pinhole, a literal pinhole, a little tiny hole, in something to uh, effectively become your lens. So I think we all know as we stop down in aperture, as the, the hole gets smaller, our depth of field gets greater, right? So a pinhole works by making that even smaller. So your depth of field is so great that the fact that there's no lens becomes less of an issue. This was actually earlier today. There is a a lot of smoke from the Canadian forest fires over the Northeast in New York City. I was out on Long Island doing a shoot. Um, this is from my car as I'm driving home. It looked it, just this crazy. There's no lens. This is the body cap, some aluminum foil and a pinhole. Same thing. An important thing if you're gonna do pinhole photos is the sensor, any dust on it at all, so these, I cleaned up the dust. This, I intentionally did not. Any dust on your sensor is gonna show up and there's gonna be dust you didn't know was there. So you might wanna blow off your sensor before you start taking pinhole pictures. I promise you, if you've ever taken the lens off of your camera, there's dust on it, no matter how clean you keep it. Um, but just try and keep it a little clean. So 
pinholes, it can be super easy. It can be fun. I just take a body cap, drill a hole in it, tape some aluminum foil over it, and punch a hole with a pin. One thing I have learned, and I keep meaning to do a more robust experiment, is the size of the hole matters a lot. Um, you do get diffraction with a smaller hole, which is where you start getting interference because the hole is so small. Um, but the size of the hole affects the sharpness. So this is this pinhole, the first one I did today. This is a bigger hole. So this hole was made just with a sewing needle poking it through. This is sewing needle poking it through and just wiggling it a little to make it bigger. I did that to see if I had made the hole too small and so the diffraction was causing the softness or if the hole was too big and causing softness. So there's this one, this one, clearly making the hole bigger made everything more blurry. And then this is taking a new piece of aluminum foil and poking a hole, but just the very tip of the needle. So the body of the needle didn't go through, it's just the tip. And you can see it's dramatically sharper. You can also see that big jagged thing on the left. That's because I poked the hole from the inside and I didn't realize how close I was to the edge of the hole. So because of that, uh, that's the drilled hole in the body cap you're seeing on the left. So make sure you center it. And to give you a sense, here are the three tests, medium hole, large hole, small hole. You can see it makes a big difference. Um, but this is one of the simplest things that you can do that's just fun. It's also something where modern cameras have made it so much easier. <laughs> You know, when I use pinholes with film, you don't know what exposure you're going to get until you process it. With a mirrorless camera in particular, I just put it on aperture priority. It knows, it doesn't know uh, how big the hole is because it can measure it, but it knows how much light is falling on the sensor. So it gives the shutter speed the correct shutter speed. You just change the ISO as you need. Most of these were at 6400 ISO because it's quite a small hole. And you can just, Experiment and see. You can take a picture and see. You can take a picture and see. Like I said at the beginning, with it being a great time to be a photographer, if you wanted to do any of these experiments 20 years ago, well, 20 years ago, digital was just starting, but they were very expensive and not very good. Um, say 25 years ago, you had to shoot a couple rolls of film, process it, see what worked, see what didn't, try it again, try it again, try it again. Now you can take five pictures, take a look. Oh, I need a longer exposure. I need a shorter exposure. More depth of field, less depth of field, different color, whatever. You can shoot, adapt, shoot, adapt, shoot, adapt. So the iteration and the speed with which you can find something you like is so much better. It is truly an incredible time to be. And then we're going to get into some stuff that's a little more different. So your digital camera, assuming you have a digital camera, um, sees in infrared and ultraviolet, probably. Almost all of them, if not all of them do, but I shouldn't say all of them because maybe some of them don't. Um, but there is a filter on the front of your sensor that's supposed to be there because if it wasn't there, everything would look weird to us because we don't see infrared and ultraviolet. Um, but you may have noticed perhaps uh, every once in a while, if you're taking a picture, maybe at an event venue, you'll see like a little speck of light on the wall through your camera that you don't see with your eye because it's, it's more sensitive to infrared. And so there's some sort of infrared light source that's controlling something that the cameras can see, but you don't. So you can have that filter removed. So I have a camera that I had that filter removed. So I had it converted to infrared. So it now has a different filter on there to filter out most of the visible light and ultraviolet. And then I put a filter on the lens as well, a heavy uh, red filter to focus it more. Um, but now that camera mostly is infrared instead of visible light. I mean, you can see through it, but it's not, uh, it's not the same. So on the left, a picture I took in Florence <clears throat> with my regular camera on the right, the infrared, you can see the sky is more poppy. It's more dramatic, but later that week, while I was there, there happened to be the Florence marathon. So I stopped and took some pictures. I had my infrared, so I took some too. And this is where things started to get interesting. So obviously it's not the same moment, but the people on the left are wearing basically what the people on the right are wearing. 
But because it's infrared and because it's all that fancy tech fabric, everything looks white. It feels like it's chariots of fire from the 20s or whatever it was, 30s. The effect of it was so interesting to me that it just lost all tone. Dark colors, light colors, everything just looks white. I mean, obviously it's converted to black and white, but that there's things that you would never know appeared that way in infrared without an infrared camera. It's a fun effect. Um, you know, it's a couple hundred bucks to have it converted. Does it make sense or not? Probably only if you have a camera sitting around that's not your main camera that you don't know what to do with. I wouldn't necessarily, unless you really, really want to do it, uh, to take an expensive new camera and convert it, although I have friends who have. Infrared self-portrait, same uh, COVID self-portrait series. And then, of course, there's things uh, that you can do in software. So I've occasionally had files that got corrupted and all sorts of weird things happen. And I'm like, this is cool. How did this happen? And so I kept trying to figure out how to do it on purpose. And I found some sources saying, if you open a JPEG in a text editor that can read the ASCII, and then you change some of the ASCII characters that you can get cool uh, corruption effects. That's probably true. I'll tell you, I've tried it half a dozen times and I've either had nothing I could see at all or so corrupted that it wouldn't even open. I've never been able to actually get something that I thought looked cool that opened. Somewhere in between, there's probably a way, but I haven't done it yet. So in trying to figure out how to do it, I found there's this website, Photomosh. I have zero affiliation with them. Um, but Photomosh, you can just go in and pick something and tell it to do corruption. This is the kind of corruption I wanted to create um, and that I've seen files just randomly get corrupted and do. It's free uh, and it's just kind of fun. You can try different things. You can control it to a point. Um, you can also, if you have Photoshop, do some crazy things, especially with curves. So curves, you know, normally we add some contrast, we make it brighter, we make it darker, maybe we adjust the shadows or the highlights. If you really, really go crazy with it, it can do some cool stuff. So uh, if that's something that interests you, I always do a layer, a new layer. Um, in this particular instance, you can see I put that little marker on the uh, on the diagonal line there on the upper right. What that does is it keeps that point static so it doesn't move when I move the rest. And then I just lifted the shadow side way up. You can see now there's blues, there's yellows, everything looks weird. Um, it almost looks like a negative, but the hair still looks normal. It, to me, this is starting to feel solarized. So I had that black and white solarized picture at the beginning. Uh, color solarized looked a little bit like this. Solarization was this happenstance thing that sometimes was super cool and sometimes didn't work at all. <clears throat> this starts to remind me of that, which I thought was very cool. There's also something you can do if you're going to do infrared or not, just because it's fun. Um, if you're in Photoshop, in RGB, you have four, three channels, a red, a green, and a blue channel, right? You can change which is which you can switch channels you can flip channels so if you go into adjustment layer channel mixer um you can choose the red the green or the blue channel and if you wanted to say flip uh the red and the blue you'd open the you'd select red then you'd slide the red to zero you'd slide the blue to 100 then you go to the blue you slide the red to 100 the blue to zero and now you have something where the red channel has become the blue channel, the blue channel has become the red channel. So all the information that was tagged as red is now blue and all the information that was tagged as blue is now red. And you get this crazy, he looks like Nightcrawler from the X-Men. Um, here I've flipped, uh, I've just reduced green by 200%. So it's not just zero, it's negative 200. That was a little too weird. So I went back and this is, flopping red and green instead of red and blue. So red, green swap, red, blue swap. Um, most people, at least that I've seen, tend to do red, blue swaps. And based on this, I like the red, blue swap more. I think the red, green swap is just crazy magenta. This is at least interesting. Uh, people that are shooting infrared with color, 
tend to do this uh, to swap the channels. All right. Uh, let's see if there are any questions. If you want to learn more me about me or about BenQ, here's where you can find them. If you want to uh, follow BenQ on Instagram, AccuColor by BenQ, BenQ North America. Let's see if. So, Tony, no questions yet. Let's give everybody a moment. While we're waiting, Ali, tell us about those new monitors. Yeah, so uh, two new 27-inch monitors. They're uh, in the photography line. So they're SW272U and 272Q. Uh, they're replacing the predecessors. So we have one 27-inch 4K and one 27-inch 2K. Uh, both can be hardware calibrated. Uh, good for 99% Adobe RGB. 100% sRGB? 100% sRGB. I think it's 98% P3 coverage and then 100% Rec. 709. Uh, James Gordon Patterson says he's thinking the 32-inch 4K. That's what I have. I have the SW321C and I love it. Great monitor. Yep, that one's the, the flagship and it'll still be the, the best at the 32-inch hardware calibrate. Uh, recommendations for someone just getting into photographic monitors, what to look for uh, from, I think, is it Abies? I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing your name wrong. Um, what I would look for is resolution. Um, although some of that affects price. So 2K versus 4K, 4K is going to be more expensive. So you have to look at what your budget is. Uh, but then you want to look at uh, the contrast ratio and you want to look at the color. Uh, rendering, how much color information it can show you. So at 100% sRGB is good. Um, and 99% Adobe RGB 98 is very, very good. You want to have that at least um, because that's going to give you the most accurate representation of your image file. So when you're working on your file or looking at your file with a monitor like that, like all of the, I believe all of the BenQ SW monitors, uh, mm -hmm. Certainly, the 321C and the and the new ones, um, you're going to have a more accurate representation of how your file looks when you're working with it. If you go with a monitor that's less color accurate with less uh, less color gamut, then you may be doing things to your file that you just can't see, and then someone with a better monitor may be able to see them. Or when you output it, something weird may happen. Uh, so that's what I would suggest is looking for something with 99% Adobe RGB. Uh, 100% sRGB, and then I prefer 4K because I want more resolution. Uh, but I'm sure there's a price difference. Ollie, what's the price difference between the 2K and the 4K on the new ones? Do you know? Uh, it's exactly double the price. So 800 for the 2K version, and then 1600 for the 4K version. So that's so then that just becomes uh, what makes sense to you. Um, I am a big believer in buy the best equipment you can afford, uh, but don't get into a bunch of credit card debt either. So if the 2K is the one that makes sense for you now, then get the 2K. It's an excellent, it's still going to be an excellent monitor, just less resolution. It's not in any way a bad monitor. It's a great monitor. Um, and then if you can afford the 4K, I would get the 4K. Uh, Tom Myrick, is it better to have two 24-inch monitors or one 32-inch monitor? That depends on who you are and how much desk space you have and how you like to work. Um, I would be more inclined probably for the 132 inch. That's what I have. Some of that's a limitation of how much desk space I have, but I also like having that really big monitor. Um, what I would be more inclined to do if I was going to have two monitors side by side is either do two 27s mm -hmm. or a 32 and a 24. Um, but having that big monitor uh, really makes a difference when you're editing and then you can put other stuff on the smaller monitor. That's my opinion, Tom. What do you think, Ollie? Uh, you took my answer. I was going to say two 27 inches. Um, for me personally, 132 inches is a little tall. Uh, I feel like it's just too much real estate. But having two 27s or even two 25 inch monitors, that's good too. Well, but then you've got a lot more width that you need to do. So it depends on how much 
Yeah, exactly. Yeah. For, for me, I'd rather have the width than the height. So, Tom, it just depends on you and how much space you have. Let's see. Oh, and, uh, I'm, glad, I'm glad that helps. Uh, both Lisa, Lisa, and Tom makes sense. I currently have 224. If it works for you, that's great. And Tony, I have a question for you. How often do you calibrate your monitor? You mentioned you're a Colorado. Uh, I am. Um, I am about. I typically do about once a month. Once a month. Um, there are people that will do it every couple of weeks. Uh, I have tried that. I don't really see that much drift. And I will say, once a month. You know, it's better to do it more often and not need to than not often enough and wish you had. Uh, it is really a drag if you're not paying attention and something's gone wrong and you do all this work and then everything's just a little bit off. Um, but modern monitors, you know, the BenQ LEDs, there's not much drift. So when I calibrate a month later, there's almost, there's usually just no change that I can see. Uh, back in the day when everything was CRTs, you would see, you could see dramatic differences just after a month. Anybody else? Any other questions? Uh, Ted Lee, can could you please explain how I can take headshots where the subject looks three dimensional and not two dimensional? My guess is lighting is a big factor, but could you give some tips on how the lights should be set up in the tuning of the camera? Thank you. Um, and you're welcome, James. Um, so Ted, I think the thing that makes it look more three-dimensional is having a shadow side and a highlight side. So I would suggest having a light either to the left or to the right, typically 45 degrees to start with. I don't know how many lights you have available to you, but if you just have one, just start with the light off camera so that uh, you get the texture of the face and you get the, sh the highlight side and the shadow side. Um, some people really like to light flat, so everything's even. To me, that's what causes something to feel two-dimensional as opposed to three-dimensional is you're not seeing that transition from light to, to shadow. Um, so that's how I would start. If you have two lights or three lights, I would have a main light and then a fill light. Um, maybe your fill light is two stops less bright than your main so that the shadows get filled a little, but not uh, too much. <clears throat> maybe a light for the background. Um, I do think adding a light to the background so that you can separate your subject from the background can make a big difference as well. Uh, while it's cool sometimes to see the shadow from your subject on the background, sometimes it, it can make things feel flat. Um, and then the tuning of the camera, the exposure on the camera, that really just depends on how you like to shoot. 5.6 F8 is a good safe spot uh, for headshots typically. Um, I do like to shoot wide open at 1.2 or 1.8 or 1.4. Uh, sometimes, but that's gets really tricky. And if I'm doing headshots for a client, unless they really, 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 really want that, um, I'm going to shoot stop down a little, maybe five, six, or f eight. Uh, but I think the light makes more of a difference in making it feel three dimensional than the camera settings do. Hopefully, that was helpful. See any other questions? You can always reach out later if you have questions that you think of. You know, you wake up at two in the morning and you have a burning question. If you reach out to me and I don't get back to you, just reach out to me again in a couple of weeks. It's not that I meant to ignore you. It's just that uh, I got distracted. If I'm busy with client stuff, that's going to take priority. And then I'm going to remember that somebody sent me an email two weeks ago, but not remember how to find it. Uh, one more. Oh, you're welcome, Ted. I'm glad it was helpful. Yeah, Tony, uh, I think that's the last of the questions uh, on All behalf right. of Ben Q. Uh, we thank you for presenting. And uh, a pleasure. And we're always looking forward to the next one. So until then. Sounds good. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Good night.